Welcome to the Textile Design Symposium. Our theme this year is design identity. Uh, I'm Marsha Weiss. I'm the director of the Fashion and Textiles Future Center here on campus at Thomas Jefferson University, formerly Philadelphia University and formerly Philadelphia Textile. Uh, I use all of the names depending on who I'm speaking with. Uh, I'm also the director of the Textile Design Bachelor of Science and Master of Science program. And I'm very pleased to be joined today by the core textile design faculty team, um, my brilliant colleagues, Becky Flax, who's an assistant professor and teaches pretty much everything. Um, any of you who know Becky understand that comment. Megan Kelly, who is our brilliant knit focused faculty member at both the grad and undergraduate level. And Jen Rhodes, who is not only one of our panelists this morning, but is also teaching as we speak. <laughs> so. Jen is the assistant director of the undergraduate program in textile design. Our first session today was to be uh, one of our wonderful alums from Global Textile Alliance, Lindsay Creighton. As luck would have it, and as business demands, Lindsay was suddenly called out of town. And so right about this moment, she's at 30,000 feet in the air and route to a business appointment. So um, at the very last minute, Lindsay had to step out and we look forward to having Lindsay with us for a future either spring speaker series or a fall textile design symposium. So please follow us on social media. It's the best way to keep track of all of the activities that are going on here with textile design. So um, let's see. So we are we your, your textile design faculty, we are going to share with you our design identities and our career paths. And that's how we're gonna kick off the day. So um, I'm going to start by saying, uh, Becky, would you share with us your design identity? Thanks, Marsha. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, just making sure I have all of my buttons pressed and things ready to go. Um, so, my de design identity revolves around excitement. I am what I think of as a design enthusiast. Um, there isn't a type of design, there isn't a facet of design that I don't love and find incredibly engaging and that I don't want to try and that I don't want to experience and that I, you know, that I'm hesitant to interact with. So, um, I think for me, the best way to describe my design identity is a design enthusiast. Oh, that's a brilliant way to start this. What a great way to kick it off. And I, I, I confess, I was talking with somebody in this week about, um, about Becky and the fact that Becky is so good at so many things. And I, I chalk it up to curiosity because Becky is endlessly curious, but I kind of love that design enthusiast. That's going to be that's going to be an interesting thing for the rest of us to follow. Okay, Megan, you're up. <laughs> yeah, that is hard to follow. Um, I actually find that this question is difficult for me to answer. And I think that's because in the past 20 years, I've been a various forms of an artist or a designer. And so that identity has changed over time. I uh, started out as a fiber artist, um, then I became a sculptor and a welder, and after that I made jewelry, and I've been a seamstress, and I've done crocheting and tatting and bobbin lace and just lots of different things, so now I identify as a knitter, um, and probably for the past 15 years I've identified as a knitter. Uh, at work, I'm a knitting instructor, right? So that's a slightly different role with different responsibilities and goals. And, and then in my professional, I'm just a designer. Um, and I like to design from the bottom up, like sheep to shawl, however it works. Um, so I guess, I don't know if I answered that correctly, but Definitely a knitter. Well, and, and it will be interesting based on your so, so varied path to get to this point, it will be really interesting to see where the path leads you next. Um, because it, clearly it's a continuum for you. 
and this is this is at one stop in that really interesting life as a creative. So fantastic, thank you. Jen, are you able to, to speak? Again, I know Jen's in class. I think so. Okay, brilliant. Can you hear me? I finally got, my students are all here laughing with me and I'm gonna take my mask off for a minute, guys, uh, just so that for the sake of the camera. So um, my di design identity is definitely uh, not as a tech guru for sure, um, <laughs> since we've been, I've been wrestling with, with the tech on this for 15 minutes. Um, I don't know, I never really thought about it in great detail, other than the fact that I've, I was thinking about it this morning and I've always thought about, I've always felt that good design is in the details. And if you're not thinking about every single tiny little detail and how they all come together, the, the consumer or the user's experience with your product, whatever it might be, um, isn't as good as it could be. And one of my favorite things to do as a textile designer is to create things that are beautiful, but also functional so that the fabric isn't just something that's like icing on the cake. It, it really does contribute to, um, to the flavor and successes of the cake as a whole. And then, and then absolutely color and texture come behind that. I grew up being told to stop touching everything in the store and trying to steal paint chips from hardware stores and dumping out my Crayola crayons and putting them in color wheel order without even knowing what a color wheel was. Um, so I've always loved to make things. I've always loved color and texture and just putting it all together in new and interesting ways. I, I love that comment about, about good design being in the details. And I think that really speaks to who you are, Jen, because you're, you're a brilliant strategic thinker and and that ties in so directly to thinking about all of the details and really considering how that all comes together in, as the whole. Um, you know, thinking about the fact that, that you always need to touch everything. Um, we are all, those of us in textile design, we're all tactile people. And, and it's interesting, we can see that even when tour groups come through the studio, prospective students who are drawn to either touching the cones of yarn or running their hands along a fabric that exists on one of the looms or on one of the knitting machines, we can see that level of interest already. We can sort of tell who's one of us. So, um, so, so now I'll, I'll share my design identity, um, which again, I've also been thinking about, but I'm not sure I've got a brilliant answer to this. <laughs> so I, and it's interesting when I'm with people and they say, what do you do? I, I struggle a little bit to answer that question because what I do professionally, and this speaks back to Megan's sort of comments about who she is as a creative individual, who she is in her professional life, um, who she is on campus. So depending on the context, I'll either tell people I'm, I'm a professor. Um, and when I tell them I'm a professor of textile design, I typically get a really confused look from the person I'm speaking with, because most people don't know what textile design is. And those of you who are participating today who are textile designers completely understand what I'm talking about. <laughs> so, um, and so, so I might tell people I'm a professor. Um, when I think of who I am as a creative individual, I tend to describe myself as a weaver. And um, I found myself saying to somebody within the last few weeks that I'm happiest when I'm at my loom. And, and my primary loom is behind me. I'm in my home studio today so that I don't have to be masked for this. Um, and uh, and I'm, I'm happiest when I'm sitting working through creative ideas on my loom. So, so now that said, I would love to have each of my colleagues share what their path was to textile design because each one of us took a very different path and and paths aren't always linear. So with that statement, Becky, could you share how you found textile design? Of course, thank you, Marcia. Um, so for me, it absolutely wasn't linear. And uh, I really relied on my community and individuals around me to help me shape my path. Um, coming out of high school, I was sure I was gonna be a chemical engineer. 
I was, I did my research. I knew what companies I wanted to work for. Um, I enrolled in a program that was going to prepare me for that career. And I made it um, four out of the five year program before I realized, um, and two co-ops before I realized that that really wasn't what I wanted to do. And I had a group of individuals around me because I worked at the radio station on campus who were doing graphic design work and I loved what they did and they were able to incorporate materials and color and texture into how they built their designs. So I transferred to the graphic design department as a fourth year student and I completed about a year and a half in graphic design before I realized uh, that wasn't right, but I had had the opportunity to take a few silkscreen printing courses and work with a brilliant person in the silkscreen de uh, printing department who helped me build a lab inside my own house. And so I transitioned out of school, not yet having a bachelor's, <laughs> um, into working full time in my own company, silkscreen printing for fans and businesses in Philadelphia, making t shirts and posters. Um, after doing that for about two years and enrolling in different schools for a semester to see what my next path was, um, I met a person who I printed some posters for who was coming to the thesis slash capstone slash senior show for Philly U and ran into someone who I went to high school with who was graduating with a degree in textile design and realized this was exactly the right program for me. So I came, I finished my bachelor's here after 12 years and then stayed on to get my master's. And it's everything about the path that brought me here that makes me who I am and helps me form my design identity. And, and that speaks so directly to to your the design enthusiast idea and what I see again as as your endless curiosity and it's that it's the fact that your path wasn't linear that that makes you the person that you are it makes you the the faculty member that you are it makes you the creative individual that you are makes you the brilliant team member that you are so that's fantastic thank you so now, Megan, what about your path? How did you find textile design? Since you've shared that you've done a range of things from jewelry to welding and sculpture. So how, how did you end up in textile design and how did you end up here? Um, so I have two answers to that question, actually. Uh, the conceptual kind of path um, is, is maybe a, a little bit meandering, but not quite as meandering as Becky's. Um, I went to undergrad for fibers and I stayed an extra semester to receive a double major in art history, thinking that I would go on and get my master's in art history and then eventually teach. Um, but I thought, well, let's just live life for a little bit first and see what happens. And I did a bunch of things that were kind of related to art and unrelated to art, like the welding I was building sculptures. And then I became an, a picture framer. And then after a while, I was making my own artwork, but I couldn't survive. So I was bartending and waiting tables. And then I was managing restaurants. And then when I was about 30, I thought, all right, I have to decide what I'm going to do. I'm either going to open a yarn shop or I'm going to go to grad school. And so I was searching, searching, searching for textile design related programs, but at the time I was living in Chicago and was just kind of searching in the broad Midwest area and had not even considered the East or the West Coast. And one day my then boyfriend, now husband came home and said, we're moving to Philadelphia, I have a job. And I was like, this is not part of my plan. So we moved to Philadelphia. He moved first and I moved about six weeks later. And this is the second answer to this, by the way, to this question. Um, so it's my mom and myself in a U-Haul truck moving all of our worldly goods. And my husband's already found an apartment for us here in, in Germantown, so in the area. And 
we get lost off Highway 70, I-76. I'd, I'd never driven out this far before. I'm in a U-Haul. We're lost. We end up in Roxboro. We have no idea where we are. I'm like frustrated. We finally get, you know, around the corner. And this is like, we had, this is maybe a little bit before Google Maps. Like, so we're not, I don't have the smartphone guiding me. So we're like on the phone with people who are saying, take a right here, take a left here. We, we go up Henry, we take a left on Schoolhouse Lane. And my mom says to me, oh, I had a dream last night that you're going to go to school. You're going to go to school here. And I said, what are you talking about? We don't even know what kind of school that is. We don't even know if it has a any sort of fabric or textiles or anything program, fibers program. Please stop. Like, <laughs> And so then like I, we drive, we find the apartment. The next day we take the dogs out for a walk. We walk past the school and we get the name of it and we look it up that evening and lo and behold, there's a textile design program. And it was just the most serendipitous moment because I had already started searching for slash yarn shop ideas or schools on the East Coast. And here it was on my lap. So I applied and within four months, I was enrolled in the grad program here. That's, that's a, a firm example of fate, how fate has intervened to bring you to, to where you need to be. So then, so then you did the graduate program and then what? Uh, well, then I started working for Kelborn Woolens, which is a yarn distribution company located here in Maniunk. And um, I learned, I had, I knew how to knit and I was a good knitter, but at that program, or I'm sorry, program, at that place of employment, I learned how to design for knitwear. Um, I learned how to do shaping. I had been a seamstress, so I understood how garment like woven garments were constructed, but I learned how to mimic those shapes using stitches. I also was able to design yarn, which is very exciting, working with mills all over the world. We um, developed yarns in Donegal, Ireland, uh, in Lima, Peru. We worked with a company in Belgium. We worked with a company in the Faroe Islands, designing yarns um, really to get the thinking all the way to the end product how do i want this sweater or these garments to fit on the body or to lay or to drape or to feel all the way back designing the kind of fibers the kind of twist the ply uh the color um even the packaging uh so that was super exciting i did that for about seven years and kind of layered on top of that i was uh, adjunct teaching here, survey, and then knit studio one. And when the opportunity came to come on full time, there's absolutely no way I would have ever said no. So I left uh, Kelborn and they're a wonderful little firm and continue to make amazing stuff. And I still work with them when I can. Um, but I've been here now. This is the beginning of my third year. Just again, such a fantastic story. I, I love the fact, and I think it's important for, for our students especially to hear that the paths aren't necessarily linear, that you go through all of these different phases to, to become the person you are, to become in the place where you are. Um, and, and to be fair, when, when Megan was adjunct teaching with us and the opportunity looked like it was going to happen for her to join us full time, we spent a good amount of time working out together in the gym and we'd be on side-by-side -side treadmills and I'd be going, so now what about coming and joining us full time? So. <laughs> yeah, it was fun. That was, that was a, an exciting moment, I think. <laughs> well, it's, it's fantastic to have you with us. So Jen, how about your story? What led you to textile design? Um, when I was in high school, I knew I wanted to do something art related and creative, but I didn't want to be an art teacher. I didn't want to be a fashion designer, no offense guys. And uh, 
And I was thinking about art history and my art teacher looked at me and said, are you independently wealthy? And do you wanna spend the next 10 years of your life in school so that you can have a career in art history? And I said, no. And he said, then do something else. And he gave me a postcard to the summer workshop that was being held at Philadelphia College of Textiles and Science. And it was free, which was the magic word. And um, I lived about, 40 minutes away. So I was able to get here via public transportation. And so I signed up and I attended in July of 1991 uh, between junior and senior year. The first day it was interesting. The second day was a little better. The third day we did weaving and um, I went home that night and I told my parents, this is what I'm going to school for. And I still have that piece of cloth hanging up on my office wall at home. Uh, and I've, I've just never looked back. I've always loved it. By the time I graduated, I was a little burned out and really loved working with the machinery and the more technical side of the industry. So um, I actually took a job in manufacturing for automotive. And uh, at the ripe old age of 22 years old, I was responsible for the production of 150 velvet weaving machines and 30 associates in the middle of the night in rural North Carolina. One of the best jobs I've had. Um, but I missed my creative outlet. And so I went into product development for the same firm and loved it. I got to go to technician training school uh, for Dornier Looms. So that was pretty amazing. Um, I'd sit at my desk and design, uh, design new patterns and new fabrics to try to get them to pass uh, all the rigid testing for automotive to hand them over to uh, the design department to use in their toolbox. And if my sample weavers were swamped, I'd go home at lunch, change my clothes and come back and help them run equipment the rest of the day. Um, but being from the Northeast, I missed my family and being so far away. So I relocated to New York and I uh, wasn't sure what I wanted to do in the New York market. So I took a job in sales with uh, one of the CAD companies, Point Carré, which is the system we have here, as you know. Um, and I got to understand the New York market and figure out what I wanted to do. And I went to work for one of my customers in drapery and top of the bed. I needed a little bit of contract work. Um, in 2002, 2003 timeframe, I could go into almost any major retailer and find one of my fabrics sewn into product. So that was pretty amazing. And um, after seven years at that company, I went into memory foam sleep products, which was really cool because I got to see a lot of the marketing and branding and do a lot of that stuff that I hadn't done before. Um, got to see my product on TV with QVC. So that was even more exciting than seeing it on the store, in the store. And uh, left that role uh, when my son hit kindergarten so that I could be home more often and did some freelance and consulting work. Uh, I had brought a student design competition. When I was working in memory foam sleep products, I did two student design competitions here that I brought to campus uh, that, that was designed to kind of mimic my job and teach the students um, what it takes to get product out the door successfully. And that was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed it. And my boss at the time kept telling me, what are you doing here? You need to be teaching. You need to go to the school and go do that. And um, I said, well, it's funny because that's what I've always wanted to do. I just haven't had the opportunity yet. And uh, in April of 2015, I ran into Marsha at the fashion show and she said, I have been trying to reach you. Did you change your email? Would you love to come teach with us? And I said, yes. And I went home that night and I told my husband, I was just offered a position to teach. I'm gonna start in the fall. And he said, what class? I said, I, I don't know, <laughs> I didn't even ask. So uh, I've been teaching since the fall of 15. In uh, 2018 is when I became the assistant director of the textile design program. I graduated 25 years ago and last fall uh, started down a path of something I've always wanted to do, but I never had the time or the money or the passion to make the sacrifice for the time or the money. And I started one class at a time working on my master's in textile design. Um, so I'm three and a half classes in and um, you guys will all graduate before me, uh, but I'm really enjoying it. And a friend of mine from undergrad came to campus yesterday for the first time in a really long time. And we were walking the hallways and she asked me, she said, why after all this time did you 
start working on your master's in textile design. She's like, what's the point? What is it? What are you going to get out of it that you didn't already get from all of your experience in industry? And I looked at her and I said, you know, it's giving me the opportunity to do all the things I've always wanted to try and never had the chance to do in the jobs I had. So, um, so yeah, that's my story. I'll well, never I, look back. Every day is a new adventure. I don't, I've, I've loved every job I've had, you know, when I left them, it was time. Um, but, but all of my roles have been a little bit different and um, really rewarding. Yeah, fantastic. And, and I think, I think it, it highlights the fact that, um, that each path leads us to where we are. Um, and like you and I, we were meant to run into each other at that fashion show. Thank you to our fashion design program for holding an annual fashion show. So, <laughs> so that, so that we could reconnect and, and Jen ends up with us now. So, which is fantastic. Um, well, my path is relatively similar sort of to Jen's. Um, I, when I was in high school, I participated in a regional summer art program. I was the, I was the creative kid that I did well academically, but I also hung out in the art room as much as I could. And in a program after ninth grade, this regional summer program, um, kind of a three week intensive, it's the first time I did weaving and it clicked. So throughout high school, I thought I was going to become a high school art teacher. Um, that's what, that's the path I was, that's the path I was on. And at that point in time, that field was really oversaturated. So it looked like, okay, I can earn the degree in four years. And then what, yeah. what am I going to do? If I can't get a job teaching, what am I going to do then with that, with that education? And did not, as much as I love my parents, did not want to live in their basement. Um, so my high school art teacher said, you should look at Philadelphia textile. You should look at textile design. And I looked at the program. I looked at the career success rate, the job placement rate, which was fantastic and thought, well, it looks like I could earn a creative degree in my field and get a job doing something I love. So I only applied to Philadelphia textile. Um, I was pretty confident I was going to be accepted. Um, so I came here and almost never looked back. <laughs> I, in my sophomore year in undergrad, I actually thought seriously about switching my major to physics because I really love physics. Um, Philadelphia Textile didn't have a major in physics and I was pretty immersed in the university at that point. I had my friends, I was involved in clubs. So I really wasn't interested in transferring. So I just stayed put. And I'm very thankful. Um, I did internships after each year, after freshman, after sophomore, after junior year. And the one after my junior year was in-home furnishings, in window treatments, primarily, also some top of bed, and Jen spoke about those also. It was in New York, um, and it went really well. The way I landed my first job out of college is I picked up the phone and called my boss, um, my, who, the gentleman who was my boss for the summer and said, Hey, I'm graduating. And he said, come up and see me. So he walked me around the floor and said, y'all remember Marsha, she's coming back to us. So that's how I learned I had been offered and accepted a job. Um, so, so I moved to New York right after, out of undergrad. Um, it was fantastic. Um, young single in New York is a joyful time. So um, I was up there uh, with the company for 15 years, and then we were transferred to our corporate headquarters in North Carolina. Pretty significant culture shock going from Manhattan to North Carolina, but it was fantastic. So I was, I was with the company up until 2002, yes, up until 2002, and um, at which point the company was essentially being broken apart. Um, it was a, a Burlington when I joined it had 80,000 employees. Um, it was a massive international firm. And then it was going through kind of a hostile takeover. So at that point I had the chance to decide what did I wanna do with my life? And did I wanna stay with the company? Did I want to stay with my division although it was being sold? And all I wanted to do, did I wanna go work for somebody else? Um, all I wanted to do 
was go back to school. Um, it was at this point that I realized I had marketable skills because my customers were offering me opportunities and all I wanted was to go back to school to earn my master's degree so I could teach. So my husband and I once again <laughs> quit our jobs, sold our home, moved, um, and I earned my MFA in fibers um, at Savannah College of Art and Design. They hired me to teach and to create a new business unit for them when I graduated. Um, so I was doing that. And then Philadelphia University reached out and said, one of my former professors from Philly U reached out and said, it's time you come back. So we moved back north. And uh, I've been here now since January 2006, and I don't know exactly when I started running the programs, but um, it's been joyful. And so my path is much more linear, I think, certainly than Becky's and Megan's, and in some ways parallels Jen's. Oh, and I missed two years, two years in there, I did automotive interiors. Um, and that niche, that two-year niche, Headhunters called me for a decade after that. So, um, so I guess my, you know, my point of this is follow your passion. And, and that's what I hope for our students who are joining us today is that you all take advantage of the opportunities that school brings you in terms of getting to know people in different parts of the industry, exploring different options, doing different things in the summer, like take advantage of all of the vast opportunities in front of you and see where those things lead. Um, I, like I was pulled into the automotive business because it was a brand new division and they needed somebody who understood weaving and I understand weaving really pretty well. So they pulled me into it. I got to work with great people throughout my career. I've traveled a lot. Um, I've traveled internationally and domestically a lot, um, which is both good and bad, but um, Anyway, so it's been it's been joyful. So um, let's see. So now, I would like to know from each of our panelists if there's a class that's your favorite one to teach, or if there's a particular project that's your favorite one to teach, and why. And of course, nobody knew I was going to ask this question, so I, I might be stumping people. Um, okay, Becky. So that's, I'm going to say that's a really hard question, um, specifically because of how I identify, because that would be like choosing, you know, one discipline over the other, one passion over another, one material, one media, one textile development technique over one uh, another. Um, and so I would say my so i'm not going to answer that directly <laughs> i'm going to answer that indirectly um and say that my favorite thing to teach is a question that stumps me so my favorite thing to, to my favorite thing to share my favorite thing to explore my favorite thing to teach is when i'm presented with the opportunity not only to do research and investigate on my own, but to do it with my students. Brilliant. That's fantastic. And 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 I agree with that comment from the standpoint of it it stretches you when when you're when you're essentially are a, when a question is posed that either stumps you or that moves beyond your body of knowledge, it puts us back into that student role, which is fantastic. It is. So you know it, in every one of my classes, I get those questions in every, you know, and or when people are not in my classes anymore, and they've had me for Jackard, or they've had me for knit tech, and they say, I want to try this. This is how I'm thinking about doing it. How would you approach it? I love those types of questions. And I love getting to talk through ideas and talk through opportunities with people. That's fantastic. Megan. So I think um, I agree with Becky in the love of the challenge. Like, so the classes that I, are really challenging tend to be the most rewarding. 
Um, for me, that's a little bit more specific. So Knit Tech 2 is a class that has been both a challenge and a complete joy to teach. And part of that is because it involves a deep dive into the facts and the history um, and the technical aspects of knitting, which I just cannot get enough of because I just think knitting is endlessly fascinating. Um, even the parts that I know really well, I'm just like, wow, it's just so great how that loop is formed and how, you know, how the loop is the deciding factor of everything in the whole knitted piece. Um, I can really nerd out on that. Um, and then the counterpart to that, I think, is Knit Studio 2, which I have created into a garment uh, creation class. So understanding 3D forms and teaching to that and then helping the student. This class tends to have just a handful of students, so it's a lot of one-on-one -on -one and like getting them to understand it. And the challenge that comes into that class for me is math. I am not good at it, or I find it very challenging. And so when it is math and applied math to something that I can physically see if that works or not, all of a sudden it clicks. And then I think a lot of people have this hang up. You're either good in math and you like it, or you're not good at math and you hate it. And so when you find that you can teach it to someone who, you know, is not that confident and then they get it, then you're like, oh yes, you know, yes, this is great. Let's go forward on this and move. Um, and let's do it again, or let's, you know, like, let's do it to the left or whatever. So I find that those two classes are the most challenging and therefore the most rewarding. Yeah, that's fantastic. And I, I love your comments about math, because I do think, especially a lot of design students consider themselves or believe that they're not good at math. But to the point that you just made, Megan, the applied mathematics, it, it leads to something. Um, and mm -hmm. what I'm thinking about is, perhaps two years ago, I sat in on one of Becky's Knit Tech One classes, and it happened to be the class where the students were doing essentially shaping, like doing the math for shaping. Super fun. I love math, love, love, love it. And um, there's a lot of math in textile design, but again, it's all applied, whether you're weaving or knitting or whatever, um, it, it is applied. And so to me, it's very visual and I can see how it works. So I don't know if the students loved the class as much as I did, but I, I know I came out of that class saying to Becky, when, tell me when you teach it next semester, I want to sit in again. <laughs> so, <laughs> and I, certainly what students learn in that class leads directly into what you're doing, Megan, with the students in your class and understanding that, you know, that that's a, such a huge part of it. In addition to all of the form fit function that you're layering onto it. Um, so that's great. So, so Jen, of course, your teaching survey of textiles, is there a particular um, segment of survey of textiles that is your your favorite to teach? Yeah, I would definitely one of the one of the things I love about teaching survey in general, though, is that I get to share all the really cool things about textiles uh, with our students. Um, I always tell them that survey of textiles is the art, the science, and the history of the fabrics we're surrounded with. Um, so I love that in 1942, we had a black market for nylon stockings. Um, so like, I love all those little fun weirdo facts that you pick up along the way. But my two favorite things to teach uh, in survey are definitely weaving, which I think maybe these guys know because I definitely light up a little bit differently for the few days that we're talking about weaving. And just before we came into the classroom, we were in the weave lab and I had my hands in machinery showing them how all the parts work. Um, so I do absolutely enjoy that. But I also, uh, what's become my favorite lecture of the entire semester is the one about color and trend. Um, so I'm very excited to be working on a new course that will be that I'll be teaching next year. Uh, in color. I was hoping you were going to mention that because if you didn't, little I was plug. going to. <laughs> <laughs> a little plug. Um, so, so look for that on the schedule next spring. Uh, but 
but that's, those are my two favorites of, of all the things I love about survey. Um, the little bit of everything is definitely, definitely uh, appealing, but, but weaving in color. That's fantastic. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And I'm looking at the time. So um, we're happy to open this up to questions. If any members of our audience have questions, you can use the Q&A uh, function at the bottom of your screen to raise any questions. We're happy to address them. I see, I see one question that has come up, which is what advice, what advice would we give to somebody who's trying to decide if textile design is the right discipline for them as opposed to other creative majors? Any thoughts on that? I think that this is a great question because how can anyone be sure of anything really? right before in, in the future, you don't know until you've tried it. But the beautiful thing about textile design is that it really does encompass all aspects of creativity. There's like the analytical side, there's the, as Jen mentioned, like your love of color. There's, if you like to paint, there's opportunities for painting or creating uh, two-dimensional forms. There's opportunities for sculpting, creating three-dimensional forms, and, and then using this kind of incredible spectrum of equipment and tools too, to create these visions that you have. And the thing is that maybe that people maybe overlook is that textiles are literally everywhere, right? So you have an opportunity to touch any aspect of life after you get a degree in textile design. So, I mean, the opportunities for creativity and then also for functionality are endless in textile design. That's a great response, thank you. Jen, Becky, do you wanna to add to that? I saw Jen come on, so I just wanted to make sure I wasn't gonna speak uh, over her, but um, I agree. I think that that's a fantastic response. And um, I think what what can draw people to a, a major like textile design or our, our sort of sister program, textile product science, is the desire to, to work with your hands, to investigate and ask questions and to, like any design field to improve lives. And so those are sort of the foundations of what we do. And so if you are excited about those things and you like to work with your hands and are willing to touch and to test and to push and to iterate, so try something and try something else and continue to try, those are really at the core of what we do. And so, um, you know, that would be my answer. I think we're going to hear more thing more from our speakers throughout the day. I think we're going to hear similar responses um, from our other speakers. And I, I would add that, that uh, when we talk to prospective students about textile design, we say, if you'd like to work with your hands, and now I've heard that, um, if you're collaborative by nature, because textile design is a very collaborative discipline. Megan spoke to the fact that the textile, the textiles touch almost every aspect of our lives. And so we work with people across disciplines very regularly, uh, whether that's with fashion designers to create garments or with architects to consider building skins or with industrial designers to create furniture. There's so many opportunities for collaboration, not including manufacturing and Jen shared that she was running a plant at 22 as a female from the Northeast in North Carolina on third shift, not an easy job, not an easy job. And to Jen's students in class, you need to ask her more about that because I'm sure there are fantastic stories from that time. Um, so we are collaborative by nature. We also tend, most textile designers, tend to be in the background as opposed to the foreground. 
most of you probably couldn't name a famous textile designer. Um, Jacqueline or Larson it was, perhaps, it was perhaps the most famous textile designer. And when he passed away, I was reading a notice in one of my trade magazines about that. And I said to my husband, who has lived with a textile designer for decades, I said, oh my God, Jacqueline or Larson passed away. And he said, who is Jacqueline or Larson? So, um, so most of us, most, of, most people couldn't name a textile designer. But if you're passionate about color and texture, if you're passionate about form, um, if you are tactile by nature, yeah, maybe it's textile design. So let's see, do we have any other questions? Um, let's see, so a, one of our questions is, do you prefer functional textiles like fabrics we use in clothing or upholstery or decorative textiles like tapestries or fiber art? That's a great question. And, and I think like for me to answer that, I would say it depends. It depends, it depends on the context. Um, so I do have clients who commission me to create tapestries for their walls, um, but I also do a fair amount of consulting with functional textiles. Perhaps the most unusual one was working with the Oak Ridge National Laboratories in Tennessee to create a textile from a highly specialized fiber to harvest heavy metals from the sea. It had very interesting specific qualities that the textile needed to be. So, um, so I think it depends. They're both, it kind of goes back to what Becky said earlier is it, it makes us think and stretch and grow. Um, does anyone else want to comment on that question? I would counter with uh, what about the function of beauty? Like sometimes decorative pieces are just there, their function is to provide color and aesthetic, beautiful beauty to the room and to the space that it's in. So sometimes they're one and the same. That's a great comment. M moving on to the next question, what's inspiring you right now? I would love to have each one of us answer that. Okay, uh, I'm gonna go first. And um, what's inspiring me right now at this moment is, are the research opportunities that I have taken on. So um, I'm currently working with a professor in biology and we are now investigating invasive plants for dye potential and we're moving on to berries, which is really exciting because it's a little bit more glamorous than you know roots and stems. Um, I'm also very excited about research that I'm doing with one of the students on this webinar, uh, where we're going to be looking at bioplastics for shade goods um, for a international competition that's happening in the spring. Um, I'm also really excited about work that I'm doing at home, developing ways to do tapestry-like techniques on industrial weaving equipment using things that I've learned from industrial knitting equipment. So that's really exciting and inspiring. Um, and I got a new toy for the department, which is a gimbal, which allows you to take really nice steady footage. And so having the opportunity to work with that and do cool things with that is inspiring me right now. And not surprisingly, Becky's inspired by many things. Megan or Jen, what's inspiring you? Um, so right now my Current work, I've been painting and then translating those images into knitted structures. So this is purely um, for the function of aesthetics, we'll say. This is not garments or wearables, uh, but I'm doing that kind of when I'm using like my, I need to use my creative brain to de-stress. Um, and then the other thing I've been working on are a collection of garments that are based on Greek tunics. And so I've been doing a lot of research into how those are worn, um, how they are, uh, how I can make them modern for like the modern aesthetic. And so just kind of 
it's a little bit less about being inspired and more about just doing it right now is kind of where I'm at with that project. I look forward to seeing where that where those end up. That that sounds fantastic. I hope you'll share them as you move forward. So, and Jen, what's inspiring you? Oh, uh, that depends on the day. I have a running list that I keep in a notebook at home of things that have inspired me or made me want to do some research and learn more about for an eventual project down the road. Um, but one thing I've always had interest in, like even as a high school student before I even really understood what yarn was, uh, was keeping our waterways clean. Um, and uh, my husband and I try to spend a lot of time along Chesapeake Bay and we've been looking for properties there. And so that has kind of inspired me for the work that I'm doing this semester in my graduate class. And that's uh, ways to keep the waterways clean in terms of removing plastics. I do a lot of reading about the, the microplastic effects on the environment. And um, I'm also really fascinated by the concept of turning ocean plastic into yarn. Uh, a friend of mine from undergrad actually has done a lot of work as so. So textile designers can be engineers too. So there's a little plug for that. Um, but there's been work collecting ocean plastics and turning them into yarn. And I find that really fascinating because as much as I love natural fibers, there's also a part of my brain that really loves what we can do with synthetics um, and finding a way to do it more responsibly. And so, so that's kind of got me excited right now. And I'm gonna answer quickly because there's one more question we'll take and then, then we have to move on. Um, so the two things that are inspiring me right now, um, first and foremost, always my students inspire me. Um, there are so many times that students are working on something in the studio that, um, that make me go, oh, oh, here's how I would do it. Here's an idea. What about this? So our students always inspire me. Um, it is you, you, our students are the absolute best part of my job. Um, no offense to my colleagues. <laughs> so, and then the other thing that inspires me is I'm working on, I've just started a new series of weavings um, for wall pieces here at home and they're double cloth, so two layer, e-cut, tie dyeing the warp yarn, the yarn in a pattern before I weave it. Um, and they're inspired by sort of mid-century compositions. So I've just started those. I've literally thrown the first like six picks on the loom. Um, so that's inspiring. And we're going to take this one last question. And then we're going to thank everybody for joining us for our first session today. So here's a question from one of our students from Ashley. What is one alternate field of study that you feel connected to and believe is important to dip into while within the textile world? That's a great question. I'm looking at my colleagues to see if anybody, Jen. I'll go. Uh, I'm, I enjoy the marketing and the branding of it. Um, I have a lot of respect for companies who do their marketing so well. And I think the reason the field of marketing and studying consumer behavior is so interesting to me because we can design the most beautiful, amazing product that exists. And if we don't have someone to market it well, it doesn't go anywhere. Um, and so consumer behavior to me is really fascinating, the science behind sales and marketing and consumer behaviors. And, um, and also how bad marketing can mislead consumers is a huge, is a huge thing for me. So, so my answer this week is, is marketing and consumer behaviors. I find that fascinating. Yeah, and, and, and I would say that this, this ties back into something that Megan said earlier, um, the, that the flexibility within textile design allows each person to really customize their path. And so I think each one of us and each one of you has found, will find, is finding what other fields interest you. And to me, that comes back to passion and engagement. Because truly, if you end up working in a field that you feel passionate about, that you feel this is what you're meant to do, every day is not going to be easy. And for those of you who are, who are in the program now, you already know this. Every day is not easy. Every day is not fun. 
But if you're doing what you feel you meant to do, it makes it really worthwhile. So with that, we're going to thank everybody for joining us for our first session. Please join us at 1030 for our session with Todd Bowles. Um, Todd is a super engaging presenter and um, we look forward to seeing you with us at 1030. All right, thanks very much. Have a good day.